Hi everyone, it's Miss Simmons again. I wanted to talk to you guys about my last segment here on my World War II slideshow, and that is specifically going to be ta me talking about women in World War II and also talking about the Manhattan Project and the dropping of the atomic bomb. There seems to be a little bit of a lag here, but there we go. Okay, so women specifically in their role in World War II. Throughout American history, women have worked mainly in the home, but many women have worked outside of the home. There's going to be a big shift in World War II in the type of work that women do. They're taking on for the first time in this war roles that were traditionally seen of as roles that men held in the workforce. Um, and specifically women building things in factories like planes or tanks or jeeps or trucks, um, ships, other things. These were jobs that were considered specifically male dominated fields and women are taking on those jobs for the first time in World War II. Women are also getting pretty much heavily involved in the military. They're not seeing combat duty. They would not have been allowed to have served in that sense, but they are doing clerical work in the military. Um, some of them are pilots delivering planes from munitions factories directly to military bases. And so women are becoming more and more involved in the workplace outside of the home. About 350,000 women worked directly for the military during World War II, and about 5, William, 5 million men, women, excuse me, total, entered the workforce between 1940 and 1945. We have up here an image that shows the different types of jobs that women took on in the military. So this first woman, she's representing Rosie the Riveter. A riveter is someone who is putting together major pieces of equipment, whether it's a ship or a plane. Um, she's riveting specifically things together that can be used in weapons of war. This next woman is a nurse over in World War II, over 1600 women as nurses received recognition for courage under fire. So while they didn't serve in combat duty, they certainly saw combat duty as nurses and sometimes directly helped men who were serving in combat duty. Um, as nurses out in the fields helping people. Then you have all these women right here who are representing different branches of the armed forces. You have WAX, who are women auxiliary corps in the army. Um, you have WAVES, who are women serving in the Navy. You have WASPs, who are women service pilots serving for the Air Force. And you have women specifically serving in the Coast Guard as well. The main job that women held in the military were clerical jobs, meaning they acted as secretaries or communications people. They might be transmitting messages via phones. Um, they mainly worked in offices. The second largest group of women working outside of the home in World War II were women working in defense plants and factories. Um, and those are the Rosie the Riveter type of women who are serving in World War II. By 1943, the majority of women, excuse me, the majority of people who built planes were actually women in the United States. Pilots also flew planes directly from factories to military bases. I know you guys can't see this particular poster, but it's a mother talking to her daughter saying he'll be home sooner now that you're in a wave. And this poster right here on the bottom left, this was actually used on the AP exam in the past. It says she's a WOW. A WOW stands for Women's Ordnance Worker. That means someone who's making bombs, making um, bullets, making guns, making things that are specifically used in times of war. And then next to her is this whole other list of different hats that women could wear in the different branches of the military. One of the things that was difficult for women is if they were married and their husband was serving in World War II and they had children, um, child care as it exists today really did not exist. Eleanor Roosevelt petitioned her husband, worked with her husband to try to set something up so that women could work outside of the home, and that resulted in creating the Community Facilities Act of 1942. This helped to establish seven centers that served over 105,000 children during the war as child care facilities as women went off to work. That didn't mean that all women had access to that, but that did help, especially in major places like Detroit or Seattle, where you're seeing entire businesses turn over 
instead of building cars, turning over their industry as the arsenal of democracy, um, now creating tanks or planes or ships or something else that's going to be used during war. One of the interesting things that I found in my research is that while nylons were not available for women, and certainly food is being rationed and gasoline is being rationed during World War II, one thing that they decided, the government decided never to ration was makeup. Because the idea was that women needed to appear feminine um, for wartime morale. And so women could constantly buy as much makeup as they wanted to, and they were expected to appear in public as a feminine person um, depicting their role in whatever they were doing to support the war effort. African-American women also definitely served during World War II in all of the capacities that we saw in this image right here, but they faced discrimination. Oftentimes you would have uh, white women who refused to work next to or with African-American women in munitions plants. And African-American nurses could not help white soldiers at all. They could only help African-American um, soldiers. Remember, World War II is the last war where units are completely segregated. The Korean War is the first war where we have integration of the military. One of the things that happens after World War II is that, especially in factory jobs, women were laid off in large numbers. And the idea was as men were returning home from World War II, those jobs needed to be opened up for men returning home. Most women, when polled, asked if they wanted to stay on the jobs. About 75% of them in several polls said that they wanted to stay on working in that capacity that they had worked during the war but the majority of them did go home um, to be wives or mothers and take care of children. We often think of the 1950s as an era where women are becoming wives and mothers and that's their sole kind of purpose in life. But still in the 1950s, 32% of all women in the United States still worked outside of the home. And about half of those women who worked outside of the home in the 1950s were married. So, World War II, while we are seeing a shift back toward traditional views of women, we're also seeing World War II as kind of a turning point toward getting more women involved in the workplace. Women in World War II were definitely paid less than men doing the exact same job. And up here, you can see this poster lays out exactly if you are a woman working in the in as a wave, what would your specific um, salary be? So that's pretty much traditional um, way of looking at how women were specifically paid during World War II. The last thing I want to talk about is the Manhattan Project. So <clears throat> one of the things that happened even before the United States is involved in the war is Albert Einstein, who had immigrated to the United States, he was ethnically Jewish, came to the United States and worked in several universities. Um, he warned in August of 19, 1939 in a letter to President Roosevelt that Germany was developing a super weapon. And specifically, um, Einstein cited the work of several very notable physicists who were working with uranium to figure out ways to split atoms and use that capability to be able to um, make the super weapon. And Einstein warned FDR that this work was going on. Um, FDR took this to mean that the United States should, in fact, also develop a super weapon in case Germany had one so that we could combat that attack that Germany might place on the United States. This led to the creation of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project happened over several places in the United States. Probably the most famous place where the Manhattan Project took place was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, because that's where the bombs were actually created and tested. But a lot of research was also done at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and also in Washington State. Um, and there were all kinds of people working on this. Many people did not understand the overall effort of what they were trying to create. They knew the specific job that they were working on. Um, Vice President, the, it was so secretive to work on the Manhattan Project that Vice President Truman didn't even find out that the Manhattan Project existed until after FDR passed away. And he is the one who ultimately made the decision to use the atomic bomb, dropping that on Japan in August of 1945. 
In this image you see up here, you can see a sign that was at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and it has Uncle Sam kind of overlooking the people as they're leaving and three different monkeys. It says what you see here, what you do here, what you hear her when you leave here, let it stay here. This kind of really emphasizes the top secret nature. And while this I cannot get rid of right now, but if you go to the Google slide that I posted on Classroom, you can see this map and you can see specifically where the Manhattan Project was being worked on in the United States. So toward the end of FDR's life, he had met with the other allied powers at Yalta. That's the last major conference that FDR attended with the other major allied powers, specifically meeting with Churchill and Stalin at Yalta. And they decided many things at Yalta one of the things they decided is what was going to happen to Eastern Europe um, after the war was over, as Stalin had taken his troops from the Soviet Union eastward and, and liberated Berlin in the eastern part of Germany. So they discussed what was going to happen to all of that territory. They also created the UN out of the Yalta Conference. But one of the other major things that they discussed at Yalta is what exactly was going to happen in the war in the Pacific and whether or not the Soviet Union would get involved in the war in the Pacific. FDR left Yalta and he died on April 12th, 1945. The Potsdam Conference is the last major conference of allied powers. It happened after Germany surrendered on May 8th, 1945. The Potsdam Conference took place in July and August of 1945. And at that Potsdam conference, part of the discussion centered around when the USSR would get involved in the war in the Pacific because Germany had been defeated. The Soviet Union had lost more lives than any other country in World War II and was kind of recouping from their losses, but Stalin did promise to come in in the war in the Pacific. Truman made the decision to drop the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki before that took place. It's one thing to remember is initially this bomb was created in, as a response to the idea that Germany was creating um, such a super weapon. There's no evidence to suggest that Japan was developing any sort of super weapon whatsoever. Truman made the decision to end the war in Japan, um, in the Pacific with Japan. He felt that it would end the war much faster if he used the two atomic bombs that we had created. And up here you can see an, a photograph of both of these bombs. The one right here is called um, Little Boy. Little Boy is the one that was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th. Prior to dropping either bomb, Truman asked Japan to surrender or face, face prompt and utter destruction, and Hirohito did not surrender after before or after Little Boy was dropped, but did surrender after Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki. To show you the destruction that specifically happened in Japan because of the dropping of these bombs and the death toll, you see 66,000 people dying in Hiroshima just from the initial blast. 39,000 died from the initial blast in Nagasaki. Thousands more died later. It's estimated that 180,000 people died from the blast at Hiroshima. Um, and you can see in some of these images the destruction left behind at Hiroshima. 13 square kilometers of the city was completely flattened after that one bomb was dropped. And again, if you go to the Google Slides itself, this box won't be there, but you can see this aerial photograph where that is dropped. And that brings us to the end of World War II. We're going to talk more about the dropping of the atomic bomb as we get into um, the start of the Cold War. To me, the dropping of the atomic bomb really is kind of the start of the Cold War. So you'll hear more about this later. Hope you guys have a great day. Bye-bye.